Hello and welcome to a new Starting Conversation series. I'm Bethany Tabor from the New Mexico Humanities Council, and this series is History, Memory, and Public Space. For the third session in our series on History, Memory, and Public Space, we invite our viewers to consider how place figures in methods of historical inquiry. Rafi and his guests discuss public and historic sites where major historical events have taken place and why their preservation is valuable for the understanding of history. With a Civil War scholar and a renowned Los Alamos physicist, this session explores the, way, the ways in which a physical place provides context and community perspectives that help us deepen our relationship to history, all so that we might learn even more from it. This series is facilitated by Rafi E. Andonian. Rafi is a best-selling author of three books, he has previously worked guiding visitors at the Gettysburg battlefields, the Civil War sites around Richmond, the Martin Luther King birth home in Atlanta, and the History Museum in Los Alamos, New Mexico. He has a master's degree in history and another master's degree in historic preservation. Dr. Dennis Denny Erickson is a physicist retired from the Los Alamos National Laboratory in northern New Mexico. His lab roles included those of scientific leader, senior level manager, and institutional executive with accomplishments spanning basic and applied science, large mission-based R&D programs, hazardous operations, and protective programs for safety, health, and environment. Denny, born and raised in Minnesota, holds an undergraduate degree in physics and mathematics from Augsburg University in Minneapolis, and a PhD in physics from the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. In his years of retirement, he has pursued public service initiatives with concentrations on Los Alamos history, community-based economic revitalization, and higher education. He is a past president and board member of the Los Alamos Historical Society, served as a citizen advisor to Los Alamos County, and acting on a lifetime commitment to liberal arts as an academic foundation, recently completed service as a proactive member of the California Lutheran University Board of Regents. Among his recognitions, Denny Erickson was named a 2019 Living Treasure of Los Alamos for his long running leadership and collaboration in strategy driven projects that promote the well being of people and community. Dr. Jennifer Murray is a military historian with a specialization in the American Civil War in the Department of History at Oklahoma State University. Murray is the author of On a Great Battlefield, The Making, Management, and Memory of Gettysburg National Military Park, 1933 to 2013, published by the University of Tennessee Press in 2014. She is currently working on a full-length biography of George Gordon Meade, tentatively titled Meade at War. Murray is a veteran faculty member at Gettysburg College's Civil War Institute and a coveted speaker at Civil War symposiums and roundtables. In addition, Murray worked as a seasonal interpretive park ranger at Gettysburg National Military Park for nine summers, 2002 to 2010. And Rafi, I will let you take it from here. Thank you, Bethany, and thank you to my panelists, and thank you, New Mexico Humanities Council. As you all know, um, this is our third episode of a three-part series. First, we spoke about history and um, what history is about, what the practice of history is, and then we spoke about monuments last time in the second episode and comparing them to historic sites and kind of diving into the meaning of monuments. And so this time here in episode three, we're gonna focus on public sites or historic sites. We, we're treating them the same for the purpose of our conversation. As you know, from the prior episodes, the way I think of the difference is, you know, monuments are a commemorative representation of a person or an event or a group of people and uh, historic sites comparatively are the site or the place where an event actually took place. So you may have some local monuments in your community for events that didn't necessarily take place in your local community, um, but at a historic site, that is where the event actually took place, such as a Trinity site in New Mexico or the Gettysburg Battlefield in Pennsylvania. And so today we're gonna focus on the meanings of the historic sites and really public sites, we're talking about places accessible to the public. And so let's start out with Jen with the question of why would a place be designated a public historic site? Well, Rafi, that's a great question. And thank you for inviting me to participate on this panel and talk about these important issues. And thanks to the New Mexico Humanities Council. The short answer to your question is 
because something important happened there or something of significance happened there. And if your listeners can think of all the various historic sites across the nation, they're really eclectic and representative of key moments or key individuals or key epics in American history. Oh, I'm a Civil War historian and worked at Gettysburg. So for our purposes, thinking about why Gettysburg or a Civil War site would be designated a public historic site is because it's a landscape to preserve the men who fought there, the Union and Confederate soldiers who fought there. It's a memorial to their deeds, their honor, and their sacrifice. And Gettysburg is unique in preservation history because the Gettysburg battlefield was preserved during the war itself. The battle, of course, takes place July 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 1863. It's a great Union victory. And the following summer, August of 1864, some local officials, primarily lawyers in the town of Gettysburg, had the foresight to start to preserve the, the land where the Union victory was won. And the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania chartered the Gettysburg Battlefield Memorial Association in August of 1864. And this is remarkable because if, if you think of the trajectory of the Civil War, the war is still going on. The deep heart of the Overland Campaign is kicking off in Virginia and Sherman's moving through the West with moving into Atlanta. And the people of Gettysburg started to preserve that battlefield. They recognized that something important happened there and that it was worth preserving forever. The Gettysburg Battlefield Memorial Association will be the first stewards of the battlefield. They'll manage it until 1895. They will preserve over 500 acres, oversee the erection of the park's first monuments to honor the Union soldiers who won there, and they will manage the battlefield until 1895 when they transfer it to the United States War Department. So as a Civil War scholar, those are landscapes to preserve the honor, the sacrifice, and the deeds, the men who gave the last full measure of devotion, as Lincoln says, fighting the American Civil War. Denny, what do you say about what constitutes, you know, creating or why these places would be designated as public historic sites? Well, I too want to thank the New Mexico um, uh, organization and uh, and Bethany for the opportunity to be on your panel, Rafi, and I'm honored uh, again to be paired with Dr. Murray. Um, as part of the, my own introduction, I want people to know that I've lived more than half my life in a history place, uh, which is Los Alamos, a, a place that uh, is increasingly well known uh, across the world for many things. Um, when we celebrated, uh, when we recognized the 60th anniversary of the laboratory um, uh, almost 20 years ago, um, we, we, called, we called Los Alamos were ideas that changed the world. Um, and that leads into the, into the reason uh, why uh, places uh, um, uh, need to be remembered. And, and the history place is in fact uh, based on remembrance, either uh, an event um, or a uh, consequence or a, a way of life that we need to remember for its lessons. Some examples, uh, it, it's impressive to me how many uh, of these places, historic places commemorate or recognize war and violence. And it's not so much the war or the violence, it's the consequence, it's the impact, it's the heroics, it's the efforts of people. And I think in my lifetime, the most significant place I've been, uh, which, which is a recognition like this, is the uh, US uh, cemetery uh, on Normandy Beach. Uh, it is probably the most moving place I've ever been. And it was impressive to see how many young officers who had the, who led the charge um, in, in those, in, in that landing, um, who were up front were the first people that were killed uh, in, in that beach landing. Another one that 
that uh, that recognizes people that are the consequence of violence is the 9/11 Museum in New York. Um, the uh, the 2001 um, uh, act of terrorism that took almost 3,000 lives. For those of us that have been in that place and have been in that room uh, down in the lower level that has almost 3,000 photographs of the people that, that died in that uh, um, event, you cannot, you, you cannot be moved <laughs> looking at the faces, uh, the many faces, um, uh, young and old, um, many ethnicities, um, to understand uh, the consequence uh, of violence. Uh, on the, in contrast, um, other places uh, uh, are used to recognize ways of life. And a couple of examples, there is a uh, small um, uh, home museum in the Lake Country of Sweden that commemorates uh, Carl Larson, a, a well-known uh, Swedish folk artist and his family. And you can just feel uh, what life was like almost 100 years ago and uh, and his growing family and his art that was done in that place. Uh, a final example of, of a way of life is the um, uh, summer palace of Peter the Great on the Baltic that dates back um, more than 300 years now. It was the beginning of modern day Russia. Um, it's impressive that it suffered dramatically during the siege of Leningrad in World War II. But the, uh, the Soviet Union restored it. Um, and to me, when I saw that, it was, it was an example of people that, that wanted to commemorate something special in their lives. On the other hand, it represented a way of life that, that finally and fortunately uh, went by the way because of the impact and the price that common people paid for such places. So there are lessons in all these places and many of the other places that we'll mention today. Absolutely, I think the examples that you all are giving are, um, they put vivid images in my mind, and I think there is a certain evocativeness to that. And, and so, and it leads me to my next question in mind, which is, what is the value of these historic sites as a method of learning history compared to reading books? Jen, what, what would you say with your experience? Well, I, I love this question, Rafi, and I'm so passionate about teaching outside of the, the classroom and the, in the outdoor environment. So I wanted to uh, share a, a Civil War quote, a very iconic one by Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, who of course commands the 20th Maine at the Battle of Gettysburg and goes on to be governor of Maine and really important in Civil War preservation. And Chamberlain captures this question in just a few words when he says, in great deeds, something abides, on great fields, something stays. And to me, that is the essence of preserving historic sites in our nation or, or in world history. Now, I've had, I've had the good fortune of working as a public historian, as, as you have, at the nation's leading Civil War site and to be on that landscape. And then I've also taught in higher education for uh, 10 years now. And I've been really passionate as a professor to take students outside of the classroom and take them on to Civil War battlefields like Gettysburg or walk through the National Cemetery at Antietam or visit John Brown's site in Harper's Ferry. And Denny mentioned the, the American Cemetery at Normandy um, a couple of years ago, five years ago now, I led a study abroad trip with some students in Virginia where we spent 16 days mm -hmm. traveling through Europe covering the World War II campaigns. We started in England crossed the channel, talked about D-Day. We spent time in Paris, went to the Battle of Bastogne, went over to the Eagle's Nest, went to Bavaria. We cut, went to a concentration camp. We covered all the major hits of World War II. Then a year or two later, I led a study abroad trip to World War I battlefields. And speaking for myself, World War I is a war that 
never really greatly interest me. You know, it's, it's sort of shoved between the Civil War for us and World War II. But when you can stand in the trenches at Verdun, or you can stand in the trenches at the Somme and see that landscape, walk those footsteps that soldiers walked 100 years ago or 75 years ago for World War II, it's incredibly powerful. And the best combination then is when you take your knowledge that you learned in a classroom, you take your knowledge from reading your books or watching your documentaries, and you combine it with standing on that landscape, on that terrain, and it's incredibly powerful, uh, very priceless. Then he mentioned the cemetery, just one final cap on that. There's nothing as moving as standing in the American cemetery at Normandy at five o'clock and you hear taps playing mm -hmm. and you watch the American flag being lowered and folded. It's incredibly powerful, very powerful. I think what Jen is describing is an experience that you have when you're actually on site. And I know, you know, you touched on this, Jen, for me, there's certainly an interaction between reading and the experience. And then that fuels me wanting to read more, which then fuels me to want to go back to the same places or more to new places or more new places. And so it was really great uh, perspective from someone who, you know, has led um, a lot of different programs at a lot of different places. Now, Denny, what would you say is to kind of from your experience, having been involved a lot in the community and, um, you know, what the value of these sites is as a method of learning history compared to um, reading books? The, the place provides context for the story and the remembrance. And um, it, it actually completes the story. Uh, being able to stand in the trenches at Verdun, being able to look at the grave marker gravestones um, in Normandy, being in the sub basement in the museum in New York, um, walking uh, in, in living rooms and in pathways here in Los Alamos where uh, people from generations ago walked and people that I respect dramatically and uh, all these places uh, had heroes. But it provides dimension, a dimension, a third dimension, if you like, that you can't get from reading, that you can't get from looking at photographs, uh, that you can't get even from watching uh, movies. It's being in the place, it's getting the feel for uh for what what happened what the event uh, that we want to remember uh and so it, it's an important context and i say it it completes the story yeah absolutely that's well said it's the interconnection between all those parts that you're describing to help complete the story right and your understanding and your um you know your connection to it um so that brings me to a question on comparing historic sites to monuments. I know we've been touching on that, um, you know, over the course of the series, and now that we're focusing on historic sites, I want to I want us to elaborate a little bit on that. Certainly, monuments are on people's minds, and we focused on that in a prior episode. But I want to focus a little bit on the historic site side and compare and say, you know, what these historic sites? How do they invite historical inquiry um, compared to monuments? Uh, Jen, what do you have to say about that? Well, the historic site is, is where the event happened. And the monument, as you all covered in previous episodes, was put up later to reflect or commemorate a particular point of view. And I would say from my experience working at, at Gettysburg, Gettysburg National Military Park receives over a million visitors each year incredible amount of people come to Gettysburg and they come there for really diverse and eclectic reasons. Some people want to stand in the National Cemetery, see where Lincoln delivered the Gettysburg Address. It's that power of connection, like you and Denny mentioned. It's completing the story to stand there where Lincoln delivered that famous speech. Or other people want to walk the fields of Pickett's Charge. They want to follow in the footsteps of particular Union or Confederate regiments or corps or brigades. So they come there for, for a variety of reasons. Now, Civil War battlefields get a little tricky 
because they also have monuments on them. And you can think of Gettysburg, your listeners can think of maybe a Civil War battlefield they visited. Gettysburg particularly is complex because there's over 1,600 monuments and markers on the battlefield. So you have the historic site, then it's layered with a commemorative landscape on top of that. And those monuments mostly commemorate the deeds of the Union soldiers, the men who fought in the Army of the Potomac. Those monuments are mostly put up in the 1880s, right around the 25th anniversary of the Civil War. And then Confederate monuments are added yet to the landscape and Confederate states, um, which there are 11 on the Gettysburg battlefield, will erect monuments through the 20th century. So the historic site where it happens can be complex or complicated when you overlay a commemorative landscape onto it. Yeah, those two things can certainly merge as you point out and, and you know, um, and certainly invites a lot of inquiry when you're when those two pieces merge because a lot of historical inquiry and trying to understand the layers of history and memory there. Um, Denny, what do you have to say about you know historic sites inviting inviting um, historical inquiry compared to monuments? Well, I, I want to. Uh, there's not much I can do to uh, embellish um, Jen's definition of place versus monument. So what, what I want to do is give some examples of monuments or statues or whatever that work. Uh, and then I want to give one that, that is not working. Um, and th one of the examples is the uh, statues up, up here in Los Alamos on the, the green, which was in the middle of uh, the Manhattan Day uh, Laboratory. And it's a life-size statue of Robert Oppenheimer and General Leslie Groves, um, one the military army leader and the other the scientific um, physicist that, that led uh, Los Alamos. Um, it is provided in, in it's, it's cited in context of, of the old part of the, of, of the town that was in the middle of the Manhattan Day uh, laboratory. It has become the iconic photo that is grabbed by visitors that come through here. And that one works. And it works because it's in a context that embellish or adds to the, to the story and the place, if you will. Another one is also in, in Los Alamos. Um, and uh, one of our highways, state highways that passes through our county, uh, takes you to Bandelier National Monument which is the ancestral home of, of uh, our local Pueblo and, and other um, Native Americans. The Pueblo is San Ildefonso, uh, which is noted for its uh, pottery um, and, and its artisans. The, the most famous one is Maria Martinez. Um, several years ago, um, uh, that was part of an effort to enhance that part of the highway that passes through the county. And a good idea was that maybe the Pueblo, San, San Ildefonso Pueblo, uh, would be willing to provide uh, some large, bigger than life replica pots um, and place them uh, along the highway here in the county on, on People's Way to Bandelier. Well, it turns out after negotiation and negotiation with a Pueblo is not a easy thing to do because they they have sovereign status. Uh, they agreed. Uh, the county paid uh, artisans to create these uh, very large um, uh, replica pots. There are six of them. They tell the story um, of pottery in, in, in our native Pueblo culture. And in fact, um, it, it honors our neighbors and it honors their ancestors that were in Bandelier. And it was a joint effort of, of communicating, of respecting each other and of, of uh, telling a, a story of people long ago that have evolved in, in, into present communities. Um, one that, 
that doesn't work, are, there are numerous statues of, of the Spanish conquistadors that conquered uh, uh, what's now New Mexico, Arizona, Southern Colorado. Um, and uh, several years ago, decades ago, uh, statues were created and placed in Albuquerque and uh, in the valley here in the, in the Rio Grande Valley. Um, and in the last decade, um, we've become increasingly aware and sensitive to people who were conquered, uh, who were not treated well, who were not treated appropriately, who were not remembered well. Um, and those statues of conquistadors have been taken down and put away in storage um, because of the because of the, the sensitivity that we've developed um, in a multicultural setting. So that that was those statues were put up in good faith by people who respected the culture that was the dominant culture. But as we as time forward, we uh, we understood the other side of the story. And right now, New Mexico is in a quandary as to what to do with those kind of things. Yeah, I think what I'm hearing from you all is that, you know, um, the historic sites, while they certainly, you know, there's always people telling the story about historic sites in these, in these public areas, there's more room for these different perspectives and, you know, uh, different ways of remembering and discussing what happened at the site. Uh, but when you get into the issue of monuments, then you're talking about a specific perspective of those that put up the monument. And sometimes those two, you know, interact. I mean, such as such as Gettysburg, as, as you pointed out, Jen, you know, you may have monuments that are from a specific perspective that kind of go into the larger sea, if you will, of the site where there are multiple perspectives and contested perspectives. And and both, you know, New Mexico and Los Alamos and and certainly the um, ancestral lands in New Mexico and and Gettysburg and other Civil War sites in the East Coast, they, they really uh, remind us that there are a lot of narratives that are running in these sites, right? So I guess my next question for you all is, how do these historical narratives and these mythologies uh, get created and perpetuated at these historic sites? Benny, what would you say as far as the um, uh, historic sites and, and the, uh, uh, how they help, uh, you know, perpetuate these narratives and these mythologies? How are they created there? How are they perpetuated there? What's your thought process? The, uh, the, the previous episode in this three-part series was about memory. And memory from generation to generation, um, from year to year, but more generation to generation, changes as we, as we lose uh, direct co connection with the event that made made a place um, significant. Um, again, referring to, to my own place of history, Los Alamos, uh, when I came here as a young physicist, brought my young family with me in the early 70s, uh, we were only 25 years out from the end of the war, from Nagasaki and the Hiroshima events. Um, so I knew some of the people, they were senior mentors to me, that were here during that time. I knew even better the generation that replaced them. Well, now it's, it's uh, 50 years later. Um, I'd say two more generations uh, have, have uh, entered the town. Uh, the, the generation of the Manhattan days are pretty much gone. The generation of the people in the 50s and 60s are the same way, either have left or are gone. Um, so the, 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 sense of, the sense of place and the story that goes with it, um, it is, is coming from a different perspective. And people are hungry to hear the, the, to hear the stories. But they're going to interpret those stories. They're going to digest those stories in their own terms, in their own um, uh, understanding. I, I can also go back to the 60th anniversary in the early part of the last decade, where the lab uh, recognized its, its uh, beginnings. 
um, we did a we did an audience analysis, and we found out that more than half of our staff in the laboratory uh, knew nothing about the Manhattan Project, uh, knew nothing about the the uh, Korean War, um, knew very little about the Vietnam War, and that kind of went on like that. And so we did a series of of uh, history talks of, of the, the, the technical history that happened in the laboratory and some of the personalities. We didn't think many people would be interested wrong. All these young people that were hungry to hear the stories showed up in packed auditoriums, uh, lecture after lecture after lecture. And I contend uh, even now uh, people are hungry to hear the stories of these places, but again, they're gonna they're gonna have a different reference point. Um, so the books that are written, the places that we commemorate, uh, whatever, they're all important in providing a reflection on places that need to be remembered. One of the things I find fascinating about Los Alamos with the layers you're describing and is in hungry hunger for learning is that. You know, in my experience, many people that were visitors to Los Alamos would come for because they know it because of the atomic bomb and the Manhattan Project, but they would leave with an interest also in the Los Alamos Range School, for example, which was prior to the Manhattan Project. And um, I found that fascinating and, and, and very in, informative as well, because the Ranch School to me represents in many ways um, the early 20th century and the values that were captured in the early decades of the 20th century. And so there's, there's kind of a before Manhattan Project, uh, during Manhattan Project and after Manhattan Project perspectives in Los Alamos. And depending on who the audience is, depending on what their interests are, depending on what their personal experiences are, um, kind of seems to uh, illustrate or kind of navigate where their particular interest is and what narrative they start to see about Los Alamos. Now, I know Gettysburg is very much like that too. And Jen, you've written a book on, on this topic of how you know, uh, these, these narratives come about you know, and, at these sites and how you know, these mythologies are created and perpetuated. So what would you say about how these historic sites create and perpetuate these narratives and mythologies? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And Gettysburg, no doubt, is a landscape and a story full of interwoven facts and myths and fact and fiction and mythology. And some of your listeners might have heard the description of Gettysburg being called the high water mark or the high tide of the Confederacy. This notion that the Battle of Gettysburg is this trajectory where the Civil War changes, the high tide. And that concept is completely fabricated. It's made up by one individual. And if you want to understand Gettysburg and the mythology behind it, um, we'll be well served to know a little bit about John Batchelder. Uh, John Batchelder is not a Civil War soldier. He's a resident of New Hampshire who makes his way down to Gettysburg just a few days after this Titanic clash. And he spends three months around the battlefield interviewing wounded Union and Confederate soldiers and sketching the landscape. And in doing so, Batchelder becomes unofficially the first historian of the Battle of Gettysburg. Then he ends up moving into Virginia and he's invited into the camp of the Army of the Potomac where he interviews people like George Gordon Meade and some other of the Union officers and soldiers that winter. Batchelder will be one of the key players in the Gettysburg Battlefield Memorial Association, the GBMA that I, I referenced earlier. And there's a great anecdote where Batchelder is, is walking around the battlefield with one of the, the aides of George Pickett's staff. Now Pickett and his men make this famous charge on July 3rd, Pickett's Charge, 1863. And they're walking around the battlefield several years after the war is over, and they're standing at the center of the Union line, looking across the fields of Pickett's Charge. And the aide, uh, Walter Harrison, says to Batchelder that that's the point where they converged their attack on July the 3rd. And he's pointing 
to this group of trees, this copse of trees. And Batchelder says, well, those trees then must have been the high watermark of the rebellion. And, the, and then it's born. This tangible group of trees becomes called the copse of trees, a word that's very bizarre in our language, right? It's an old English word that evokes some sort of reverence. And Batchelder completely makes up this tangible spot on the Gettysburg battlefield that was not only the high watermark of the battle, but it involves the high watermark of the entire Civil War. So Batchelder then urges the local farmer not to cut those trees down. Of course, Union veterans and Confederate veterans are coming back and they're starting to snipe at the trees and make canes out of them, right? They're taking the wood off of the trees to make canes out of them. And he asked the GBMA to put a monument there. So there's our layered landscape, Rafa. You put a monument for the high water mark, create an iron fence around the copse of trees, and a monument goes up in 1892 that honors both the Union and Confederate soldiers who participated in the attack. But there's no way you can understand Gettysburg without knowing a little bit about John Batchelder and trying to disentangle fact and fiction, which can be really tricky to do. That's right, and there are a lot of perspectives tied up in these sorts of things because, you know, I remember from my time there, even how you viewed a high watermark, you know, depending on maybe where your ancestors fought or what side they fought on, that's going to influence how you view that monument and that narrative and that story, right? And so I think one thing that's fascinating to me about both Los Alamos and Gettysburg is that there's kind of a domestic versus abroad dynamic as well. I remember when I worked at Gettysburg, you know, uh, the campaign when General Lee leads the Southern Army up into Northern Territory and the invasion, uh, the, the, the story of invasion and the concern of invasion from the Union States and what that, what that looks like, right? And what that means for them because they're not used to it as much as say Virginia, which constantly had armies down there during the Civil War. And what that means is that, you know, later on, uh, those, those, those are part of the story that go wrapped up into the high watermark, right? Is kind of this thought process of, you know, where they came and, and also the different experience of say the locals at Gettysburg who, on, you know, on whose property the battle played out, right? And so there's these different experiences. I think similarly in Los Alamos story, you know, you may have a different perspective if you're in Los Alamos versus, say, Hiroshima, right? There are these different ways you can look at these, and um, the value, they both are historic sites, is, so is um, Trinity Site, you know, where the atomic bomb was tested for the first time, also in New Mexico. And uh, there's this dynamic of how you view a place that is in your backyard versus how you view a place that is far away. And we've been touching on all kinds of places overseas and locally, that really kind of helps illustrate, I think, you know, this uh, different ways and different perspectives of looking at these things, which is something I really like to dive into. So a uh, question I have for you, uh, Denny, I'll start with you on this one is, is, you know, how do you handle these conflicting perspectives on historic sites? I mean, you know, these, uh, they exist in many aspects in New Mexico history. And I know you've done a lot of community work and dealt with these politics and how do you handle these conflicts with different perspectives on historic sites? So if I answer personally, I would say I handle it with patience and I, I try to listen and I try to sit on my hands until um, the other person has had their say. Um, I, I want to use, uh, again, Los Alamos, the place I know best as as an example of, of where there are conflicting perspectives. Um, Los Alamos is a, um, is a provocative place in history and it's provocative because of what happened here in 1943 through 45 and then into the Cold War and even into today. Um, and the reason that makes it provocative is the weapon that was created. Um, many of us that are uh, scientists, engineers, technologists, uh, really appreciate the, 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 the teamwork and the, 
the innovation that, that was done during that period to solve seemingly impossible problems. Um, we also appreciate the, the teamwork and the network of the, of the various places, the plants and whatever uh, in the Manhattan Project that, that came together uh, to be able to create this thing. Um, it, it's, uh, it, it was the birthplace of big science in our country that we've seen in, in many ways uh, since. A, a contemporary example is what the pharmaceuticals have done um, in this in our country and across the world to, to provide a vaccine at a reasonable time, a very reasonable time to, to treat uh, COVID. Um, but this this uh, ability to provide uh, lots of technology, lots of science to connect the, the places that things are done. Um, it, it was emblematic here in, in Los Alamos where the bomb was designed, the science was, was uh, advanced and the the, uh, the bomb was assembled and ultimately delivered uh, for delivery. Um, so people respect the science, but they don't respect, some people do not respect the way it was used. Um, some people respect the way it was used in a, in a end result sense ending uh, World War II in the Pacific. Other people say that it could have been used, it could have been demonstrated, you could have convinced the Japanese in another way. We'll, we'll never know. Um, what we have difficulty, especially today, is, is putting ourselves in the chairs of people that were there, um, that, that struggled with you know, what to do, how to do it, um, when, to, when to do it, why to do it. <clears throat> You know, it's history that hopefully can help us uh, understand um, some of these things and to at least have intelligent questions. Uh, right now, Los Alamos is getting ready to renovate one of the houses um, that was used by the scientists and leadership um, uh, during the Manhattan days. Uh, we have the Historical Society has been given what we call the Oppenheimer House where uh, Robert and Kitty and ultimately their two young children lived during the war years. Um, rather than turn this into a kind of a fact-based um, uh, part of our museum approach campus, uh, we're struggling with how to make it a place that plants questions so you can leave the place with things to think about, with lessons not only to be learned, but to try and be learned, um, with, 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 the, uh, with the ability to listen to multiple sides of the, of the conversation. Um, so that, 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 you know, the ability to listen and the ability to have patience with each other, which we seem to have lost in our contemporary society right now, is, is really important. And hopefully historic places provide a place for that. I think that's well said in that I think historic sites, because of where we started, you know, the, how provocative they can be, are great places to go and have, you know, get provoked into questions, to inquire, as you point out walk away with some questions and not be so conclusive to the answers. Jen, I know you have a lot of experience in this and um, as well, and you've obviously led, led people through all kinds of different places and handled very many perspectives. So you have much experience in handling um, these different perspectives on public sites. So wh what would you contribute to this conversation? Well, I, I would add two things. Uh, one's related to the Civil War and the Civil War and historic sites invoke controversy. We're talking about heavy issues today. We're talking about the Civil War and slavery. We're talking about World War II and the atomic bomb and questions of morality. And in 2000, the United States Congress directed that Civil War sites managed by the National Park Service by the federal government include a discussion in, of slavery in their exhibits. And this culminated at Gettysburg with the opening of the new museum in 2008, 
But there are plenty of people through the late 20th century, early 21st century segments of society who found it hypocritical that Civil War sites would discuss slavery. The battlefields were places to talk about strategies and tactics and generals and soldiers, but not discussion of the war's causes and consequences. When I worked at Gettysburg, I did a campfire program on the causes of the Civil War, which could be pretty electrifying as people are forced to grapple with the question of slavery. You know, my ancestor fought in the army in Northern Virginia, but he did not own slaves. What does that mean for me? How should I reconcile this in the 21st century? But a final thought on that, we have to have space to have these hard conversations. And our job as academics or as public historians or, or stewards of history in whatever fashion is to create that environment. And the United States government had the opportunity to talk about the atomic bomb at the Smithsonian in the late 1990s when they put together the exhibit on the Enola Gay. And you, you might remember how controversial that was steeped in the culture wars and the Air and Space Museum abdicated the responsibility to have this hard conversation by pooling the exhibit. So today, if you want to see the Enola Gay, you can see the fuselage at the Air and Space Museum at Uverhazy, but there's no context to this, this airplane. There's no context to it at all. So history is complicated and these sites facilitate really hard, but very, very important discussions. Yeah, so my takeaway from you two on this is, you know, the complexity, the layers, the, and the space to, you know, have that dialogue and continue to see different perspectives. And because of the experience that historic sites provide, there is really, you know, in many ways, no better forum to have these discussions because it goes beyond intellectual when you're at these sites to experiences, to connections, to other people, other perspectives. And that connection, I think, takes you to a different emotional and mental place that opens you up in a fashion that, you know, it's hard to um, create in other environments. And that's how learning ha it happens is when we inquire further, when we dig deeper and we ask more questions. So with that, we'll conclude today's conversation on the public sites and Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Denny. And thank you to the New Mexico Humanities Council again. And I'll hand it to Bethany. Uh, that was a fantastic conversation. Um, I really appreciate all three of your generosity and your insight. And, um, and I so appreciate, uh, Denny and Jen, your work um, to facilitate closing the gap between, between place and, and history and the public. Um, I think that it's... Uh, it's so important. Um, I was already a believer in the importance of public sites and now um, I'm <laughs> fully convinced even more. Um, so thank you for your advocacy and, uh, and your work. And as always in the description of this video, we will link to some resources uh, for further reading or further investigation inquiry. Um, as we all know, I hope that <laughs> the takeaway from our listeners is that uh, inquiry first and foremost is, is the best. Uh, the best step to take. So thank you all so much again, and thanks for tuning in.